All right, Marginal Gains listeners and, and TV viewers, uh, really awesome special guest today. This is an interview I've want to, been wanting to bring you guys for a while. An uh, old friend of mine, uh, but both in that we're both now getting old. Um, and I think we've been friends for, it's got to be coming on 20 years. Uh, and maybe friends is a strong word. I don't know. You're giving me a look, but, <laughs> but I've got no, no, Gerard. I'm just thinking about the 20 years. <laughs> I've got Gerard Vrooman, uh, co-founder of Cervello. Um, gosh, I mean, uh, somebody who's really just changed the industry in so many ways from there to, well, uh, let's, we'll talk about it in, in this show. So Gerard, welcome to Marginal Gains. Well, uh, thanks for having me, Josh. <laughs> well, I think so, when you say friends, maybe people have visions of us, you know, hanging out every Friday night at the bar, which is pretty difficult given that we're on two different continents. But, uh, there's that. you know, it's, uh, you know, in the industry, of course, there are people you come across that you think are complete jackasses. And then there are people, <laughs> luckily not too many, there's some. And there are people that you, you know, like to spend time with and then also respect from a professional point of view and uh, and sometimes ask their opinion or, or find ways to collaborate or what have you. Yeah, that, that's an excellent way to put it, especially the jackasses part. We, we all let's make a list. So we start with that's that. Right. That's right. <laughs> See, we have uh, uh, people in common. <laughs> oh, God. No, I, I, I mean, you you are on my list of, of people truly that I feel like we can have not seen each other for a year and you'll like run into each other, like at the airport, you know, at the airport. And I feel like we can just pick up as if we talked to each other yesterday or a week. I don't know. It's, it, I, I there's a shared wavelength or something there. So help help our listeners, uh, I guess, with the history here. You know, I, uh, first time, do you remember when I first met you? Do you uh, no. This, this, I, I love this story. I'm thinking, uh, no, I'll I don't I'll give you a hint, actually. the Tama Shanter. Oh, that was a beautiful establishment. <laughs> That's unfortunately been replaced by something really tacky. Yes. Because it was really high class, <laughs> but when we were in the Tam O'Shanter, but um, oh, wow. yeah, so that would be uh, that would be two years later than the Peter Pan Motor Lodge, which could have been uh, the place too. <laughs> oh, uh, but man. that was in Anaheim. So. Yeah, <laughs> this is Las Vegas. Yeah, this was um, this was funny because this was uh, the cheapest place in Las Vegas, uh, mostly yeah. because uh, the humans were outnumbered by far by cockroaches and other uh, <laughs> animals, but uh, yeah. but it was also the closest to the sands convention center uh actually closer than the people who stayed at the hotel that is part of the sands uh convention center because then yep. you had to you know wait for the elevator <laughs> a long time and the tam o'shanter had a a back door that let you straight into the basically the driveway of the of the sands so it was um and it's one of those places that was uh so shabby that they didn't mind you you know taking a hacksaw to a to a steer or something in your in your hotel room as long as you brushed uh you know all the shavings into the very very deep shag carpet sufficiently so that nobody I, else would notice so it was oh the, the mechanic i'm blank on his name but he said you've got to meet it was he grabbed andy and i said you've got to meet these guys and we went to your to the hotel and we got there i'm like i smell paint <laughs> and you were essentially painting the bikes for the show or, or doing Maybe some sort of this a p3 work. or something was this 99 or uh, it would have been like 99 um yeah. and yeah i mean it's good that you smell the painting that means we were by that time done uh you know cutting and sawing all the wood to make our own uh, bike stands to make the, yeah. so we just finished that and then probably received this frame first prototype frame of the alloy p3 which then of course it was just uh it was just finished welding so it was just silver and then phil had this black spray paint we yeah. called barbecue paint i'm not, still not sure why that's called barbecue paint <laughs> um but uh and then so that's you know flat black so that's the easiest to paint yourself without it being too obvious that you painted it yourself and there were no bottom bracket threads cut into it so we used like a, a toilet roll to sort of make up <laughs> you know to pick up the slack between the uh the crank and the and the bottom bracket shell and uh, yeah that, good times yeah, those are great. Those Nothing's are really great. changed since. <laughs> no. Oh, I love those days. Now, we we stayed uh, down the street at, oh God, it was like the Key Largo, or but it similarly was oh, condemned. I thought you guys were at one of those, uh, um, like the Planet Hollywood or something. No, like that, or... yeah, no, no. Andy would never stay somewhere so nice. Uh, I think it was twenty nine ninety nine a night or something in uh, that day. And my it was actually my very my first interbike was Zip. And on the second morning, we came down, and there were cops everywhere, and it was a 
one of those old uh, uh, waitresses with a you know tray of drinks at, at seven in the morning, and we said, "What what happened?" And she, in this awesome voice, said, "Somebody stabbed a prostitute." <laughs> I said, "Welcome to Vegas." It was those are those were good years. Sounds but, uh, about average. For but but so we see this bike. I mean, this P three, and I think in that moment, the industry changed. I, I mean, everybody's brain. I think just a switch was flipped um, on arrow in that moment. I mean, did you? Did you guys know you were doing that when you? Well, it was a very strange year because uh, in in first January two thousand, uh, the UCI rules would change significantly. So all these funny bikes would be outlawed. You know, like the Lotus and the Hot Eye, and like all these things that were not double diamond bikes were outlawed. And so ninety nine was the year that people either had to come up with something new or sort of give up. And a lot of people just said like, oh, we're not going to bother anymore, or they didn't have the funds or the wherewithal to come with up with something legal. And so, or a lot of people took their, you know, illegal bikes and dumbed them down a bit to fit within the rules, right? And so a lot of people were taking a step back from where they were aerodynamically. And we were, we got the rules pretty early on. I don't know why, but so, you know, we were, which I guess, you know, typical marginal gains, right? We, we were looking at the rules for, loopholes right yeah. and uh so it's like you know the the tube has to be straight well it doesn't really have to be straight you have to be able to fit a straight line through it somehow and it doesn't really have to be the tube itself you can use the gussets and so we just started to look at you know all the ways in which the uci uh did not intend us to read the rules and and that's how we tried to read them and um and then uh you know, from there came uh, the P2K and the P3. And so where a lot of people took a step back, we took a, a step forward. And um, yeah, so that sort of a gap opened up in that point and, uh, and it really meant that the P3 made a mark. That was, uh, that was uh, yeah, that was a good year. Actually, the best year was that uh, Trek came out with the Hilo copying the air, tried oh, it. Yeah. We, and we used that same show to say that we discontinue the air try because we just now with standard have uh, you know p2 level performance at that price point and, <laughs> and i know john burke was standing on his booth with like a printout of our website showing like oh, this is the bike but now you can have it from trek sort of thing you know, actually you can't get that from cervello anymore <laughs> they've, they've upgraded oh uh, timing yeah which i mean as the small company you can just move quickly um which yeah i'm not sure you can always you can certainly i'm not sure you can move faster but you can start earlier i think that's uh the conclusion i've just come to as you asked this question actually I, i'm not sure we're really fat because you can't put ten thousand people on it when you have to but, but yeah when you're a small company you're only focused on um you know a very small segment of of the industry then you're looking at that segment every day right so when you notice something when you think of something you know off you go Especially hmm. these big companies, you know, this year the focus is on new range of mountain bikes. Next year it's a new range of triathlon bikes. Then it's, uh, oh, let's do something in gravel. But it's, you know, you, you can't do everything all the time. So it's going to take time for things to get noticed. And then it's going to take time for people to get approval to do something. Hmm. And I think, I mean, like you're doing now with Silka, and it's no different from, uh, you know, what I'm doing at 3T or Open. If today I have a good idea, I start today. I don't need anybody's <laughs> permission, right? Yeah. Just, just go. No, that's a great, yeah, I, I hadn't thought of it in terms of the starting sooner, but you do, you start sooner and then you save those incremental decision points along the way. That's true. Because those are yeah. yours, yeah. Um, which is kind of the one, one of my favorite Andy Ording, uh, you know, quotes of, you know, the, the project will expand to fill the time allotted to it. <laughs> so all projects are due tomorrow. <laughs> right? You have to live in that world of, well, how soon can I get it? That's when it's due. <laughs> And, and then you just go like hell. Um, so, so with that, I mean, you guys, you, you bring this P3, total game changer. Um, I mean, I think one of the most copied there for a while kind of concepts I in the industry. Um, yeah. You guys really change the way people thought about road bikes um, in a huge way. And of course, in the mid middle of that, we have this amazing team experience with with CSC, where this scrappy little bunch of guys with a low budget and this mishmash of sponsors becomes like the top UCI team in the world. 
Um, yeah, so you take a, a, a bike company with no, no knowledge or experience in sponsoring a top level pro team and you made that up with a wheel company that has no experience uh, <laughs> supporting a pro level top team. And then you combine that with a, a pedal company that's never sponsored anybody that yeah. level before. Uh, you add uh, Easton for your cockpit with yeah. uh, not only no experience in sponsoring, they didn't even have road products when they signed the contract. <laughs> When it came to December, I said, okay, these are the handlebars and stems to me. He goes like, we don't have any product yet. That'll be like, oh, well, then you better go out and buy some data stuff, put stickers on and ship it over. <laughs> and then we also had, uh, who was the last one? Oh, SRAM. SRAM did uh, yeah. the chain and cassette. And they, of course, had no experience. They didn't even have all groups yet. They only had chains yeah. and cassettes. And they sponsored with that on the first holo pin chain. So, yeah, that was, uh, what could possibly go wrong there, Josh? <laughs> um, I, everything uh, from our experience, I think everything yes, that could everything. go wrong um, did. <laughs> and yeah, that and was, it was uh, it, it was it was weird. I don't know how it was for you, but uh, on our side, you know, everybody was super excited. Like in the company, friends, family, everybody was just over the moon that this was now like you know, Cervella was on this world stage, and everybody was having a great time with all these races. Except Phil and I, we were just, you know total panic and trying to you know not lose the sponsorship with everything going wrong everything going on behind the scenes and you just and you can't share it with anybody because everybody's like oh isn't this awesome isn't this awesome uh no but you, know, you can't say that so you go yeah, yeah yeah it's great and then you just you know turn around and go crying in a little corner somewhere yeah uh, that's that's an awesome point right because it's i think part of the the success comes from keeping the uh uh keeping the vision alive Right. And yeah, and you so, have to keep people motivated, right? I mean, it's very hard to motivate people when they see you cry. Yeah. So. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's another yeah. uh, little uh, gem of the business advice. That is. Wow. This, this could be this part of a <laughs> business podcast. Now. It could be. <laughs> but you can stop watching Shark Tank now. You can just uh, listen to I, this. I, I don't know about you. Uh, I know for me at that period, I, I really hit probably halfway into that first season where I just couldn't watch the racing anymore. I just, it was too nerve wracking. I was too worried that something would fail or break. It, it just. I had that point of January 1st, I have to say. Okay. Maybe already in training camp. I don't know. <laughs> the thing is we, we had, uh, the, the main thing was we switched to a, a carbon seat post from an alloy one and everything was the same and but the shaft was carbon and they kept breaking the real clamp at the top. So they just sheared off and then, uh, uh, which, you know, could be really annoying when you still want to <laughs> reproduce at some point as a pro cyclist and uh so you know people got upset and then okay what's going on we don't understand it the part is really the same and anyways and then another one broke and then a third one broke and it was like, yeah you know we don't really know what's going on but we think it's you know this little part that has changed to fit it in the karma thing so okay we'll ship you you know the alloy ones they have a different construction there so it won't be a problem switch to the alloy the old seat post and problem will go away and then we ship those. Do you receive them? Yes. Okay. They're in all the trucks. No problem. And then a week later, I got a call. We broke another seat post. It's impossible. There's no way. We've used this alloy seat post for, you know, five years now. We've never broken one. I said, no, they're broken another one. And then on Sun that was Saturday. Sunday, get another call. Not a race. Broke another one. These riders are irate. They don't want to ride the bike anymore. They're just, you know, they're losing their gonads. And I said, well, it's just impossible. Show me a fo send me a photo. You know, which at those days was not that easy, actually. Yes. yes. Um, you know, so they sent me a photo. I look at the photo and I go, no, that's the carbon seat post. You need <laughs> to switch to the other one. It doesn't break. And I go like, none of the mechanics looked at them. They couldn't see the difference. So they said, there's no point switching. <laughs> like, get those freaking mechanics to change. Like, and it still took three weeks and six broken seat posts before they finally switched and the problem was solved, <laughs> right? And so there you go. Like, don't try something new with the team. Don't assume the mechanics will do what you ask them. You know, the, just chase everything, chase everything. And it's like, yeah. oh, one thing after another. But uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, and I still had that, I mean, 10 years later, I still didn't really want to, you know, or with Savella Testi or whatever, you always think, I mean, you've done all the testing, you know that, it's, but you still always worry about getting that phone call. Yeah, yeah. No, it's hard to, I mean, you know, we both, been there done the doing the races in person where they can yell at you in person yeah <laughs> it's yeah, i don't know what's better. worse <laughs> yeah is it is that better or worse uh yeah I, I i think it's a great point too with the mechanics you know the our little team was 
so pushing the technology that we were way out ahead of the, the mechanics, right? Who were pr pretty much old school guys at that time. Which is um, always the case, right? I mean, they, and, they work the whole year with only one group set uh yeah. one wheel manufacturer one like so they don't have they don't have the breadth of experience that the average bike shop mechanic has right they're very very good at this very very narrow part of yeah. uh the, the work of a bike mechanic so then when we come in it's like hey er, everything is new you you start from zero again you know that most of them had never seen a zip wheel or you know because they, they were not in that environment right so it's uh yeah it, it was uh, a lot of work and i think everybody underestimated of just not saying, hey, let's just go there for a week and let's just do, let's assume they know nothing and yeah. educate them. We all thought like, these are pro team mechanics. They must be the best in the world. Yeah, no, that was certainly our mistake. We, my first trip there, it was like everything was coming apart and um, and they had all these broken wheels, but they would take the your steer tube <laughs> and they would epoxy the crack in the rim and then they would file the steer tube over top of it to make some carbon powder. Um, and then they would just give that to like the the lower tiered riders, right? Oh well, <laughs> we take well, carbon dust fixes everything. We it, all know of course, that. of course. And you know, I speaking of the crying, I remember the very first GSM cell phone that you could get. I got <laughs> that year, and sitting pretty much crying in the truck, like Andy, they're breaking everything, and they're just shaving carbon powder onto it. I can't even tell what's broken and what's not because. I mean, they were painting things, and and then we saw they were doing the same with uh, with the bikes, or or uh, oh god, what was the cleaner they used that had it was like a sodium hydroxide solution, and it was corroding the hubs, and then all the I remember the, one of the guys showing me like, yeah, watch after after a few months, I can just pressure wash the frame, and all the paint comes off. <laughs> it's like stop, stop. And, but then yeah, it was and um, look after three months there's no uh no grease left in the hubs oh my oh, god how's that possible it was oh the uh, i mean it was the aluminum was turning black and you know but then it took us a month to get them to change the cleaner because they said well yeah but this cleaner is so effective <laughs> it's yeah, like yeah I'm effective my teeth with it every night <laughs> making the paint fall off oh god those were good times so so then you you guys really have the vision and, and pulled us in early kind of post csc um, it, it, and you're certainly welcome to it. it I, I'd love to hear your version of kind of the end of the CSC relationship because you come to us with this Cervelo test team concept that, as I internalized it at that time, was sort of like, they don't listen to us, they don't pay attention, <laughs> you know, we're way out ahead of them um, and we have no say. Let's just do this ourselves and make this a team about testing product and advancing the technology and not uh a sort of black hole that we ship product into and they do what they want with um yeah i think it was uh what well, were a couple of things right uh first i think we came with you the proposal it was called the Savello road lab and then we thought leaving a drug infested team for another venture that we call a lab maybe it's not the best way to roll <laughs> so then it became the Savello test team but um yeah so there were I, I think the the funny part was that as the team got more uh, successful, we got less and less out of the sponsorship, right? And when when we started this, I still know today, like when we started the sponsorship, this was uh, team number 14 in the UCI ranking. Like it wasn't like a top a top team yeah. by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but then when they came number one, then, you know, they, they were just so focused on winning and they just never had time to go test or do this or do that. So, and, and that's what we wanted, right? We didn't want to have a team just to get this photo of the guy with his hands in the air and uh you who we want to race right like to us i think you're the same way like winning winning a race doesn't mean anything about the product right winning the race means that hey you 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 paid the guy who was going to win that race um so uh, you know we wanted to do more things and that just got harder and harder and then uh we also had um uh, some disagreements that just got bigger and bigger in the you know, during 2008 with the team about their anti-doping uh, efforts and their you know they started with the passport and stuff which was good mm -hmm. and then they said they would every six months have this report and then 
for the first half or the second half, I think 2017, this report wasn't forthcoming. And we were asking, where's the report? Where's the report? Ah, we're still doing some things. And it just got vaguer and vaguer. And the, you know, the personal relationships also start to break down as, you know, these things go. So it's just, you know, one thing led to another. And, um, and so Phil and I were just, you know, figuring out what to do next. And I said, well, we, we can do three things. We can either find a new team, which would probably be pretty much the same as the old team. Yeah. We can not have a team at all, or we can start our own team. And Phil said, well, either, Phil said, we cannot have no team. So either we find another team or we do our own team. And I said, well, I don't want to find another team because it's going to be the same. <laughs> so I vote for either our own team or no team. So, you know, this Venn diagram between <laughs> Phil and I was to do our own team, which probably was for both of us the second choice. But, um, you know, that, then it said, okay, let's, let's, do, uh, let's do our own team. And uh, we decided that just before the tour, really, sort of, more or less, that we would do that. Mm. And then we still had the Tour de France. I was at the start of Tour de France, like, with Team CSC. And so I'm talking to some of these riders, but hey, what are you doing next year? <laughs> 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 Which was, uh, I remember, uh, Gunchelar, I remember talking to him. He was like, oh, you don't understand what it takes to run a team. Like, you need so many. It's not just about the bikes and the riders. There's so many things you need to get right. I never knew what that meant. But, um, <laughs> and Jens Vogt. Talked to Jens Vogt. Stuart O'Grady. Um, yeah, it was pretty funny. No, that was it. Funny is the only person I didn't talk to about this was uh, Carlos Sastre. <laughs> he was always like, hey, you know what? I, I don't, like... All these riders are, are negotiating during the Tour de France, and he was always like, "I'm at the Tour de France to uh, win the bike race. I'm not. I, I yeah. can I can talk about contracts the whole month of August. Why would I do that now?" So so I knew that about him, and uh, so he was the only one I never really talked to. I talked to him the day after the Tour de France, so. <laughs> and and he ultimately I mean, was sort of the linchpin that he was like the first domino. Yeah, right. him and uh, Torushov. Like they were sort of, uh, you know, I guess we have a, had a classics linchpin and a, and a grand tour <laughs> linchpin, which was not really the way we thought it would go. You know, it wasn't like when I talked to Carlos, it wasn't even really about joining the team. It was just about to tell him like, Hey, you know, we're, we're out of here. Yeah. Uh, Cause I always had a good relationship with him. And so I just wanted to, him to hear it from us. And then he said, okay, I'll come along. Okay. <laughs> Unexpected. Yeah. Uh, he's he's such a nice guy. I uh, trade emails with him every once in a while, and he but he just I always love that about him that he, when he is one of those people that you know we, I'd go there and he would always first thing like oh how are the kids and he remembered their names and you know I mean, he just had that that yeah. piece about him you know that uh, it's so uncommon. Yeah, he's uh, he's a great guy. Hey, one of the few guys in that area had nothing no, nothing to worry about. I think that's why he was so at ease. Yeah, so. that's true. I know, uh, I know that uh, like when we just started the team and then we uh, we went to see the ASO to present the project because we were not guaranteed any entry into any races with the Svelte test team. So in January 2009, I guess we went to see ASO in Paris and talked to Christian Prudhomme and then he told me that at the uh, you know victory celebrations in the, on the Champs Elysees at, at the Tour 2008. When Carlos had won uh, the tour, like a rider came up to him and said, "Like, uh, hey, Christian, you won't have to worry about this winner." <laughs> so I thought that was uh, that was pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I've yes, I've heard that from n numerous other riders as well um, mm -hmm. about him. That he's just a lovely guy. So yep. crazy sport, crazy sport. So we get into test team, uh, which was just a remarkable experience. Uh, I think for us, I mean, it really it was about product it was about testing the product we really didn't have that focus on winning but then we won <laughs> like the winning came but it just wasn't the primary um everything so i'm not exactly sure what my question is here i just uh, well if, was you, just if a, you want to think about it i'm just going to pause for one second and grab something okay you know, this is the only cycling related thing I really have in my office. I don't know if you can see it, but. <laughs> yes, you see our world ranking. Oh, look at that. Cervelo test team. Isn't Number that funny? One. That, that's awesome. 
<laughs> but I think for Phil and I, you know, the, that first year of Savella Test Day, actually the second year wasn't much different. It was, was pretty much the same as the start of CSC. Like everybody was having a great time, except yeah. Phil and I. <laughs> you know, so yeah. it was, uh, yeah, it was a pretty horrendous two years. Um, and behind the scenes, it was, it was incredibly tough. So Kanchelaya uh, wasn't, wasn't wrong about that. And, you know, you know, battling management, battling the UCI, yeah. battling everything, right? And uh, it was really, uh, really, t and at the same time, trying to actually, you know, keep the bike company going. Right. And all that at the, at the height of the financial crisis. So it was, uh, <laughs> it was a pretty disastrous uh, combination of, uh, of events. Yeah. Yeah, it was really a perfect storm. Uh, I mean, I think it, so. You, you said Kinsler was right. I mean, I looking in on a pro team. I think it's not always obvious that. I mean, it, it's a big, complicated company, right? I mean, it's a big, complicated business, and it's really yeah. all about logistics um, in the back end to make it work. I mean, the, the complexities. And so, I guess, do you want to talk on that or, or to that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, you have like a one-to-one -one of what you see in front and what you see behind, right? So we had, um, we had the men's team and the women's team, right? So we had uh, almost 40 riders and roughly the same number of staff. So it's, uh, that's, you know, the, the, the bike company and the, and the cycling team were roughly the same size in the way of employees. And so that was, yeah, all of a sudden our, our company had doubled in size. Yeah. And with, uh, on average, more difficult people than we had before. <laughs> yeah, so they're very easy going and, uh, and very, very nice cyclists and there are some very difficult ones. And, uh, you know, same goes for, for you know, sports directors and, and, and all these other, I mean, the mechanics we talked about already. Um, so, yeah, I think it was, it was great and we were able to achieve some things that we really wanted to do and let people think a little bit differently about what the sport could be. Um, you know, introducing these, uh, video stories and all these kind of things, like some mm -hmm. of them have really stuck. Um, but you know, in the end and, and still today, right. I, I, I get told all the time, like, Oh, that's my favorite team of all time. And I still have the Jersey or this or that. Um, and, and, you know, both from fans and also from, from riders or by now ex riders and, and staff members, right. It really, it was something special and, uh, for those who were, part of it in some way um but of course in the end um you know less less of all that stuff has stuck than i would have liked i mean certainly the focus on on testing has persevered in you know in work but i think not not so much in action right mm -hmm. and i always use this example that i guess it's it's funny like we as a, as a society, we say that we, we love, you know, the risk takers and the innovators and all these things, but only if they're successful. Well, if, if you already know you're going to be successful, it's not a risk, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, um, and, and you don't need to test with a professional cycling team. If all you did was increase the bottom bracket stiffness by 3%, we have very good machines for that. Right. Yeah. You, you, yeah. you need, you need, a a team to test your stuff if you're really trying to do something you know out of the box that the machine cannot tell you so um but yeah so it it was uh i think we we did that you know we had some some crazy products um off of the frames the wheels i also remember rotor you know they were new as a sponsor yeah. and they uh the team forced them to do a recall on the first crank they they actually <laughs> delivered to the team so that was it was similar to our seat post experience when we started ourselves. Yeah. So we certainly, we, we had empathy towards them, but, um, yeah, their, their cranks just didn't work. And so we all switched to, you know, some other cranks and then, you know, they spent five months trying to fix it and our engineers helped them a bit as well. And it was just, I mean, mm -hmm. that was nice. It was sort of a team effort, like, okay, yeah. let's go fix this. And then, <clears throat> you know, by, by the two or roughly or so they had that, they had that fixed and working. And then, so basically the first year that they really had this big sponsorship, we caused them not to sell any cranks for the first 10 months of the year, <laughs> which, you know, they were, I mean, I understand like small company, right? It's that, that, that was very painful for them. But then yeah. those last two months of the year, they, they sold double what they sold the entire year before. So 
it worked out okay. But uh, yeah, that, that that was fun. And uh, of course, also Castelli, you know, that uh, yeah. that Gaba jersey. That was really something that that to me is still the perfect example, right? A rider comes up with an idea, says like, "What we really should have is this," and then the sponsor says, "Okay, well, let's let's sit down and try to make that." And that's that's a product yeah. that's still in their lineup today. Yeah. So that's yeah, it's uh, an iconic it's cool. an iconic product, and that was the year. You know, I think we had gone to the wind tunnel because it was such a good like a group team thing, and uh, I remember Steve Smith from Castelli was there, and we're talking arrow of clothing right and that i think was yep. another one of those kind of just uh, happenstance moments that planted a seed that became a whole range of product for them right yep. it, 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 that nobody was really thinking arrow clothing uh up to that point yeah so cat like was, cat <laughs> yes and like, wow, that's an ugly helmet. And then after a month, you think like, wow, you can spot that helmet anywhere in the Peloton. That is a great helmet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're, 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 I can't remember if it, you were there or Phil, but one of one of the tests, and I remember we took their aero helmet, had a big gap uh, to the back, and at San Diego Wind Tunnel, um, they had this box of computer punch cards. And we took the punch cards and tape and we like formed a tail on the helmet, <laughs> the helmet, and then kind of gave it to, I can't even remember who was, who the cat like person was, but kind of like, like something like this. And it ended up looking a little bit like the bell helmet that we had at, uh, at CSC, but I think it was like, oh, computer punch cards. That's, I tell that story now and people don't even know what that is. <laughs> yeah, that's true. What, did it have holes in it to uh, trip the? Yeah, yes, yeah. <laughs> uh, dimples. Uh, Excellent. So, so is that sort of, or I guess we come to the end of the team. You talked about the the financial crisis it hit. I mean, things got really, really hard for a lot of people um, in the industry. And and that for you is that kind of the beginning of the end of Cervelo for you, or no? I think did... actually uh, for me, the beginning of the end was probably already in two thousand eight. I think yeah, they want to trace it back. So uh, even before Carver's won the tour, I think uh, March of that year, my father passed away. So when I really trace it back, it was sort of that, that was the moment where I sort of, I don't know what I found important or what I was looking for sort of change. So, um, and then the stress of 2009, 2010, both on Phil and on myself was just, uh, I mean, now looking back, I think, oh, why was that? But I mean, it. it you know, it, it's not all, it wasn't all self-inflicted inflict stress. Certainly when you start in the team, that was all our own doing, but, uh, and of course the financial crisis, and then uh, we got some really nasty lawsuits and it was just everything together. I was just like, like, this is not worth it. Like, why am I, yeah. why am I doing this? And, and because of all the stress, also the relationship between Phil and myself was, was not the greatest anymore at that time. And, um, you know, I was in, uh, in Europe, trying to you know get sales and everything going there and uh, Phil was back in Canada so we also didn't uh, didn't see each other as often anymore and uh, I mean we'd always had these things we we had, I mean our our shouting matches are legendary in the, <laughs> the Toronto office but they didn't happen anymore because we were just too far away so you know instead of just shouting at each other and just getting over it uh, you know things started to fester and everything and, and we thought you know we need we need to simplify the company so we need to concentrate it again more uh, just in one office in Toronto. Probably need to have one CEO instead of two. And, uh, you know, it made sense that it was Phil because he was already in Toronto. And uh, so in yeah, end of 2010, the Cervelo test team ended. Like I found uh, uh, a way to merge it with, uh, with Garmin. And uh, so the, yeah, the last months of 2010 was basically just, you know, getting a bunch of riders uh, there, getting the whole women's team over to the Garmin uh, mm -hmm. Slipstream group <clears throat> and uh, finding other jobs for everybody else, which amazingly sort of happened. Like, um, even our worst mechanics that we never would have rehired for 2011, like we found them jobs. <laughs> um, but, um, and then, yeah, 2011, it sort of, uh, you know, the tank was empty and, uh, and it may uh, sort of step back uh, from Cervelo and it, I mean it was just a lot like all of those things but also Cervelo just gotten too big I, I didn't really enjoy the work that much anymore I spent 90% of my time managing people yeah. and I don't like people so <laughs> it was just you know 
uh, it was bad. I just wanted to do the things that I love to do, and I just didn't get, never got around to doing that. And um, so yeah, I stepped back, and then I thought, you know, I thought I was going to take some time off. But also after I stepped back, I thought, well, I have no income anymore now. So, <laughs> so I had one day of vacation, and then I uh, booked the booked the plane and flew out to uh, some supplies that I knew. Started talking to them about, you know, maybe do something else. And that then became uh, became open. Wow. And so the first open was this ridiculously light hardtail. Uh, right? I mean, that, that was yep. the first. Mm -hmm. that, 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 I remember running into you at Eurobike and just like, whoa, this thing is awesome. And of course, you, you just nailed it with the branding and the colors. And the, I mean, it... Black, you mean? <laughs> yeah, but the black with the little, wow. like the... Where did you come up with that one? <laughs> yes. <laughs> And it, it was, was matte barbecue black. Barbecue paint. Yeah, the barbecue <laughs> paint. Oh, but the little color bands, just the little details. I feel like that that's such a hallmark of, of your work to me, right? It's like the, those details. But... Um, you know, that actually just came from... Uh, mis I, I have a lot of success I, I can uh, trace back to complete communication misunderstandings. <laughs> so I... Uh, you know, the, the Cervelo E, it came from a friend of mine... Uh, Ralph Dunning, who I said, like, we need a logo for, like, on the head tube, right? Because you, like, you just put in the whole smell there. It was kind of ugly. And, uh, but, you know, the C, which a lot of people take the first letter, but the C is already Cannondale. And then, you know, it's so how to do that. And he said, like, you know what? He got a Savelle there and just put his hands on the logo. So, like, you know, the, the the one that's really significant in here is not the first letter. It's that E with the accent. So, just put that on the head tube and that was it. And then uh, when... Uh, I finally settled on the, the name uh, Open after a, a long, long, long search of really, really bad names. <laughs> um, they needed a logo for that, and then um, <coughs> we were playing a little bit with color and with, and uh, he was doing something with a circle, and I can't remember exactly what he'd done, but I said like, oh, I think of a circle, but you know, use use four colors, and I meant sort of like a target logo, right? Like just four rings in each other, but he didn't understand it, so he made the four segments in the four different colors. I was like, oh, that looks good too, sure, we'll go with that. Uh, so, and then I thought, hey, when you have that logo, you can also sort of flip it and make it a, a ring that goes on the head tube, so. Yeah. And I wanted to only do that, not put, open anywhere else, but uh, Andy talked some sense into me to, not Andy Ording, but Andy Kessler, to, yeah. uh, to also put our actual brand name somewhere on the frame so people would know what it is. And then you put it on top of the tube instead of on the side, which is just another one of those great, for me, the great touches of like, oh, wouldn't have thought of that. It totally, it just yeah, I can't works. remember why that was. I think uh, I didn't want to put it on the down tube because the bottle goes there. So that only looks good in the catalog, but not when you actually use the product. So then it went to the top of the top tube for that, uh, for the hard tail actually. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, then of course, later on, I went to the top of the top of the down tube. I always hate it when it's on the bottom of the down tube or these logos that hang underneath the center line of the down tube, like that hang too low. I just, I don't know. It's a little pet peeve of mine. Um, <laughs> I'm with you. Of nothing. But I'm, I'm with you. You can always do the, the, uh, the Cannondale, the old school Cannondale where you just put eight of them everywhere. <laughs> Top, That's bottom. Yeah. Well, as long as it's not in uh, really atrocious colors like yellow and red, I don't think red, it's yeah. that bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Seiko. <laughs> so it's a great, terrible era, right? Lion King, the whole thing. Um, it, and so so you do this hard tail, and, and it, at this point, are you, like, how do you get to the gravel bike? Because I, I had seen a gravel bike, I think, of 2011, 2012, at the Handmade Show, and was like, what the hell is this? This is kind of cool. But it, in my mind, it was like a randonneuring mountain bike mashup and then you bring the 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 up or the up and it all just sort of clicked in my head at least and i, I imagine from yeah i think uh, i mean industry i've been riding like that for a long time like when even back in the toronto days we had um for a long time uh michael berry senior um he uh you know has a really great bike shop in toronto and and he put together this uh Hell of the North ride in the fall where you would ride up, you know, from uh, the, let's say the edges of Toronto, you, you ride up uh, 80 kilometers, then you ride back. And a lot of it was on 
on dirt roads and so people would ride whatever they had so if you had a cross bike you'd ride that most people didn't have cross bikes so we would ride uh just a normal road bike and then sometimes this was like the first week of december so sometimes you'd have snow and then you're riding a 25 millimeter tire through snow which is <laughs> it's very funny but there's not much propulsion going on and uh so he stopped doing that because he was getting too afraid of uh, you know the insurance liability and things like that and then we started doing it ourselves and so i always loved that kind of riding and also in the netherlands like you just you ride on the road and you see a little path and you know let's let's see where that goes um yeah. and i mean I've, I've been riding on these sort of with a, with a road or a city bike or a kid's bike you know, since i was five like on on a forest pass because we lived right on the edge of a forest and uh, so that was always my way of riding and um and then uh yeah gravel started and and steve had because people who uh, work at bike companies are are nice people so the, he uh he, he invited me over to do the uh, almanzo okay. and um so i and he said bring uh, bring whatever bike you have that can fit the biggest tires and i thought i don't have any I mean, other than a mountain bike, but I wasn't supposed to bring a mountain bike. So, so I brought my 2009 Paris Roubaix uh, Cervelo RS uh, that was used by Torhushov to uh, finish third. So I'll bring that. So, and because it has a little bit longer stays and a bit more tire clearance for the fork. And he goes, oh, we can fit like a 33 millimeter cross tire in there. So, yeah. so I said, well, you know, you just first put the tire in into the <laughs> caliper brake and then you uh, pump it up, right? So, yeah. and, and true enough that uh, that worked and uh, and I wrote that and, and that bike rode great. And the only problem was that because this was sort of my uh, museum piece bike from Turo from 2009, they didn't want to change anything. So. And it was pretty or best. So the inner chain ring was a 44 or a 46 or something that would be fine for me as an outer ring, not as an inner ring. And luckily we, we'd, uh, we'd ordered up on the last day possible, uh, at least an 1128 cassette from QEP instead of the 1123 that was on it. Otherwise it would have been told. I didn't know there were hills in the, in the Midwest. Like, what do I know? I'm, I'm right. here. <laughs> so, um, so other than that, 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 that part was tough, but uh, the rest of it was, was amazing. And, uh, you know, I just thought, okay, that bike, it's great. The only thing we make it better is if you could fit an even bigger tire and didn't have to, you know, deflate the tire every time you wanted to put it past your caliper brake. So obviously then it became disc brakes. And then, uh, you know, Steve was saying, Hey, did you know that, uh, you know, like a 50 millimeter 650B tire is basically the same size as a 28 millimeter 700C. And so then that clicked, um, you know, to put both of those, because once you have disc brakes, you know, it doesn't matter what you do with the rim anymore, right? Yeah. So the rim can be any diameter, any shape, uh, because you don't need to brake there anymore. And so I think that's, as you say, there were gravel bikes already, but for me, it was really, you know, I want a performance gravel bike. It's not about riding for three months in Mongolia. This is about doing everything you would do on a road bike, but not being confined to the asphalt anymore. And uh, yeah, and that became the the up, and the rest is history. <laughs> it it really is. I mean, that I think every uh, pretty much every brand has a uh, we'll just call it a copy of that bike in their line now. Well, the I mean, dropped. That... Uh, chainstay has become the curved C tube of the 2010s. Yeah, <laughs> yes, that's a great way to because it's just it's that's it's a it's the solution. Yeah, it is right. the solution. And I mean, it's once you solution. figure it out, like it's the same as with the C tube, right? If your wheel is curved, then you also curve that tube, and so you either have to go to square wheels or you have to also curve the tube. Like there's no, yeah. th this is the solution to that problem, and. And it's the same, you know, if you if you have all these things fighting for space, you need to move something out of the way. And you move the chainstay out of the way by dropping it. I mean, you can you can try to raise it and uh, do other things, but you just quickly find out that's not as good as dropping it. So, um, yeah, it was. Uh, and that, I mean, the, we launched that at uh, at Sea Otter, and that's the which you know, of course, it's a race, but it's also an informal trade show, and uh, yeah. at least in those days, and. Uh, um, and I mean, I've never had really a, a, a trade show like that, where in the course of those four days, everybody from the media 
and everybody from the industry came by. Like we just had so, and I didn't mind. I thought this is going to be the greatest category of all. And you know, I need I need these other brands to also start making bikes like this. So I was, I was telling everybody what what the thought was behind it, and and he was like, and uh, you know, we'd have these couple of guys come from Specialized, and then the next day we had another group from Specialized, and I go like, can, we, can I not just do a PK session for all of you instead of just coming one by one? Like I know what's going on here. Let's just not, you know. Um, but everybody uh, came, and. Uh, and that was fun. Like, I mean, I, I don't really know a lot of people in the industry, I have to say, because they're sort of, you know, Toronto was always outside of the SoCal yeah. kind of group. And I, I guess you're the same way, right? You yeah. might sort of know people, yeah. but you're not really hanging out with people in, in that sense. Uh, and uh, just because of where you are. And, but, you know, all these, all these also young product managers would come by and just, you know, just shoot the shit about, about this bike. And, uh, you know, what they were thinking, what they were trying to do. And uh, it was really, uh, that was a great, uh, and then it took a long time for the first copy to, to arrive though. But, uh, but then once it did, it was, I can't remember what year this was. It must've been 2017 maybe, uh, where just every couple of weeks, there'll be a new bike coming with, ah, oh, drop chain state, drop chain yeah. state, drop chain. Yeah. It's just incredible. Yeah. Um, and then I thought like, wow, this, I never thought something would be, surpassing the p3 in like you know feature of choice right uh, right <laughs> but then uh yeah i don't know what the what 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 the winner is now but they're both uh, up there that's for sure yeah it, and so when did the when what year was the up or the up what did that come um out? so that was 2015 15 okay the original one yeah yeah, because I, I, I know for me, the, the, I mean, reading about it, seeing it, thinking, wow, this, and of course, I had just bought Silka and was kind of getting that started. And so not riding at all <laughs> for three years. I know how that feels. As, uh, but uh, Andy Ording uh, got an up and you guys shipped it to us. And we had a work stand at, at Silka and, and went to build it. And I remember having that moment of he had the, he had two wheel sets for it, the 700, like road wheel set and a 650 with like 47 millimeter WTBs or something on it. And just having that yeah. moment of, oh shit, <laughs> like one bike, two wheel sets, and you, and you could put a, a 26 inch wheel set on it if you wanted. It's the one bike to roll them all. Um, so someday yeah. I'll start riding again and <laughs> you can give me a call and I'll give you a call because it, it, there's there's just a real beauty to that um so yeah. you know what i find the most amazing about this whole thing with with this drop chain stay because then of course last year we came out with a wide and it it drops both chain stays because i mean structurally it's much easier right when you drop the chain stay one's dropped the other one goes straight you have this sort of mangled shape in between that you have to try and make stiff if you drop them both you have a more a nice hmm. symmetrical yoke that you can really stiffen up and then I thought like, wow, there's now been 30 companies that have, you know, dropped this right side chain stay <laughs> and none of them have thought about, why don't we drop the other side? Like everybody's right. just copy pasted to, you know, this, it's just, that was, I mean, it doesn't surprise me people did that too, because that was the solution to that problem. As you say, there's just no other way to do that. Um, but then how often they copied the drop loop, but didn't really get the tire clearance that you wanted or you know, drop that one, but never thought about dropping the other one or that that's what often surprises me about this industry. It's like, you know, just at least add something of yourself to the mix as well. Right. Which, which is surprising. Cause I think, it, and we, we have a whole episode on this, but as humans, we like symmetry, right? I mean, we love symmetry. And so it's, it, it's interesting to me that there wasn't, it seems like symmetry is sort of a, a default for people. And yet here's one where they just, everybody took the asymmetric yeah. route because maybe we couldn't see past that somehow that's that's an interesting yeah because it was because it was so obviously the solution that you didn't think about the other side right or like i don't know what the reason is but uh it took me a while too i mean otherwise i should have dropped them both from the start as well but i didn't think about it so <laughs> we... i wasn't concerned about the left one right i was just yeah i was having trouble with the right one so yeah we we all have those those moments right that uh I had one of those just recently with a, with a product where a year into it hit me like, 
oh my god <laughs> right why why haven't i thought of this until now and yeah. you just it's like you're too close to it or yeah it's too, once you see it it's obvious yeah yeah it seems seems like you should have seen it a while ago. so so you and andy kessler um have open and it's it's just you two right this is yeah we have uh i mean he works full-time i work part-time and then we have one more part-time okay uh, guy sebastian just uh to deal with the workload and then i mean of course it's it's not it's always not just you know i mean we have a bookkeeper externally we have a dark for yep. work with a lot and there you uh as they say many hands make startup light yeah but uh <laughs> Yeah, but it's uh, on the core, it's uh, one full time and two part time people. I, yeah, I, I'm a bit, I, I love and I'm a bit jealous of your, <laughs> the way you've set that up. Because as, as you have said, I mean, as it, as it gets bigger and there's more people to manage, it's your time is less spent on the fun things and more spent on the, the not so fun things, right? Or the, the human management side yep. of the, the business uh, well and also the efficiency right it's it's um i mean there, there are very few i think anybody who is either an employee or, or an employee would agree there's very few companies that are run well it's just very difficult right yep. and um i think you know uh, running a large company is very difficult you can say oh well look at uh you know amazon how well that's run by yeah but you're not jeff bezos <laughs> so you know, it's of course there's always exceptions, and you can always point at something. But in general, it's just very hard. And, and when you think about open, you know, every morning 9 a.m. we have a five-minute phone call, and the whole company knows everything. Yeah. You know, that's <laughs> uh, it's hard to achieve at Amazon. Yeah. So, but it's hard to achieve at a company of 10 people, right? It's it's just because often they say, well, you can do the stand-up meetings, yeah, but there's too many things to discuss. So then you go like, well, do, do I really need to be here for this or can I? And then before you know it, you know, yeah. people only know half of what's going on. So, but of course the, I mean, it, it's uh, it's fun to do it that way, but it's, it's also not easy, right? Because yeah. if you're just a small company, it does mean you, you need to do everything that needs to be done or decide that it shouldn't get done. Yeah. And with some things you can decide to not do it and we've you know been very rigorous and like well let's just new do not do sponsorships let's not do any marketing don't have the time for it right let's not give any credit to stores they just prepay because we don't have time to go chase them for the money and yeah, I'm, yeah. as i'm sure you know <laughs> chasing people for money in the bike industry can be a very very it's uh it's a full-time job uh, yeah and uh yes time time intensive uh, job so uh, you know, you can do all those things, but of course, especially if you don't have something like the the up and now the wide and the mind and um, yeah, if, if uh, through unforeseen circumstances, your product is more successful than you thought, then it can still be pretty hard to do it with just uh, two yeah. full-time units. Well, and then you're also, I think, a glutton for punishment because you're not just involved with open. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, that but, was a, I guess so that was a mistake. But uh, hey, <laughs> so you know us. how it works when a <laughs> when an old beautiful brand comes by. Yeah, yeah. So, no. but so, um, so talk to me about three T. What? Uh, how, how did that? How did that happen? <laughs> well, I think that I mean three T was always one of my favorite brands, and I think what's nice is that it's a. Of course, it's a traditional historic brand, but it's not. Um, it's not a classic brand. It's like, it's a brand that's always been associated with innovation and with doing new things or doing things that other people would not do or were not doing yet or weren't ready for. So, I mean, I really, I really like that combination that it has a history, but, but you know, the way that this brand goes into the future is not by making, uh, you know, lugged steel frames or, uh, you know, anything cool like stems, that. It's yeah. to, to keep <laughs> doing, um, yeah, quill stems. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's to keep doing things that other people aren't doing yet. So, um, so yeah, when the opportunity came, and then very specifically, of course, uh, that you know, the, of course, it's a big brand and uh, handlebar stems, seat posts, etc. But those were also categories that were harder and harder because all these big brands, instead of buying a, a stem from 3T, we're not thinking, hey, if we just make something ourselves, um, you know. Does the customer care? You can save a couple dollars and just slap some other made up brand on there. Um, 
and uh, you know, just nibble at a couple of dollars here and there and multiply it over a million bucks. It's uh, some good money in our pockets. So it, it got harder and harder to, of course, keep, keep the product on those bikes. In the beginning, that was still great because, you know, people would buy these bikes with whatever, you know, no brand uh, and the bars and stems on and say like, oh, I still want 3T. So the aftermarket sales really grew when the original equipment sales um, uh, dropped. But of course, there's only a matter of time before that stops as well, because if, you know, a Trekker Specialized or Savella, whoever, if they make their own stem, then they also don't need to adhere to uh, industry standards, right? You can make right. a, whatever, a square steer and a, a hexagonal uh, handlebar uh, clamping and whatever you want. Um, so pretty soon then also slowly but surely this uh, aftermarket replacement market starts to to dry up so 3t had to do something and um, of course it was already a brand that made the, the best stems and handlebars in the world so if you can add you know frames to that that are something unique and special then you really have an interesting package because now you can say well you can get a traditional frame manufacturer with some no-name parts or you can get real 3t parts and a real 3t frame that has something unique to it and um so i thought that was an interesting project and and a great way to to keep this brand into the future because i'd always i mean if you'd asked me 20 years ago you know there were always you know, four brands that are really uh, that i really loved and 3t was one of them so yeah and so when did when did you get involved there or i got really i mean I sort of got involved when uh, when Renee bought the company with some other investors in uh, 2006 or seven. I'm not sure exactly when he bought it. Um, he uh, he pretty quickly talked to us because I was Cervello, right? Right, right. And um, and so he became the sponsor of uh, Team CSC in 2008. So we were his his route into uh, top level cycling. And Cervelo also then became the first uh, company again to spec the new 3T parts because 3T mm -hmm. hadn't produced or manufactured anything uh, for the two years prior. It was sort of a, a dying brand and he just uh, you know rescued it from, uh, from the graveyard and, um, and restarted it. And so we were the first customer. So I knew Renee from there. And then, uh, oh, I don't know when, the, it must have been 2015, I think. I could be off by a year, but um, that, he, that he said, like, hey, we need to, uh, need to sit down and chat about how, how 3T is gonna go into the next, uh, the next 60 years, right? And, um, and then we thought, oh, it's a combination of frames and, and the cockpit and making everything special. And of course, I have some history in frames. Yeah. <laughs> and the brand was already there for the rest of the parts, so yeah, it sounded like a it sounded like a good project. Yeah, well, I mean, the stuff uh, you, the stuff you've launched is again game changing. I mean, I I can see your fingerprints all over <laughs> those bikes. Um, but the, oh, again, it's, I mean, it's a bigger company, of course, also for legacy reasons than Open, but uh, <clears throat> but it's by no means huge, right? So yeah, yeah, when the, when the product. Uh, conceptually the, the product come from me for a large degree. So, um, but yeah, that means that I can spend a lot of my time on stuff I like. Oh, which is awesome. Which is awesome. Well, they, the, the bikes look amazing. Uh, I mean, the, all the kits amazing, but you just launched the, uh, the race max, mm -hmm. which I really kudos on the, uh, the paint schemes as well. You know, I, I, Tell everyone I, I go so slow that my only criterion in a bicycle is really the paint job. <laughs> I thought it would be whether or not you can mount lights. Um, I, that I'm would, not that slow. Yeah, I'm not that slow. Well, and I have to ride in the dark. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I try to avoid the dark, the rain. Um, <laughs> I probably, I, I, COVID for me has actually been, been uh, a good time to get back on the bike. Cause you don't have the commute time. I'm not dropping kids at school. You know, my, my wife works crazy hours. Um, and so my typical day is just, it's full tilt until 
seven thirty, eight o'clock at night, and then it's do you try to get on the bike or do you answer the hundred emails you haven't gotten to yet today and the emails win? But uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. So how how about you? Are you on the bike these days? I mean, is there anybody on the bike industry who then doesn't answer like, <laughs> oh, I really should be on the bike more. It's like yeah. people always get into this industry because they love riding a bike and then they ride it less than, uh, than before they got into it. So uh, my, my problem is my office is, I have a home office, so my commute is zero. So Andy lives really the perfect distance from, uh, from his office. And then, so he has a good commute in and back. So that's really the way to do it. So maybe I should look for a little office. Uh, <laughs> 30 miles away from home so I can do the commute every day. But Give you an excuse to ride. It's, I, like that. I mean, uh, not even excuse, but it gives you the rhythm, right? And it's, uh, there's no, of course, I mean, I can ride the same amount of time in the morning, uh, you know, before going to the, the office next door. But um, but it's it's difficult to have that discipline. And, and you know, yeah. there's something waiting and you might as well do that first. And before you know it, it's way past lunchtime. You quickly do that. And before you know it, it's way past dinner time. And, so yeah but we can't complain so no when we get to ride it's always really nice stuff yeah so. <laughs> that is for sure right that's kind of my my belief if i'm gonna ride i i want perfection <laughs> i ride my nice bike with my nice wheels and my nice tires i'm just gonna ride it very slowly but yeah. uh awesome. i know it's it's gotten better this year i think uh, i think i'll be okay at the end of this year but uh, we'll uh, we'll see good all right. Well, Gerard, it's always a pleasure talking to you, catching up, uh, hearing your thoughts on things. And uh, thank you so much for being with us today on uh, Marginal Gains. No worries. Good luck with the podcast. And uh, I can always come back. Yes, we'll certainly <laughs> have you back. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Josh. Cheers.